Well, thank you very much, and it's a real pleasure to be with you today. Um, I always get interesting when, uh, when I hear my website description being read out, and I don't feel anything like it. So let me just give you the quickie version of who I really am. Uh, my name is Patricia, and I was born in the tea plantations of Sri Lanka. And I, gosh, I haven't even said anything about sex, and you're already <laughs> cheering. I mean, really? OK, I grew up there, went to medical school in Sri Lanka, so I'm a doctor by initial training, and did my postgraduate study in Hawaii. That's where I actually got into sex, although I knew something because my son was already two and a half years old. <laughs> and in Hawaii, I was worshiping in a wonderful Bible-based church, as well as studying about sex and sexual health. My professor was actually at that time, and I'm now 75 years old, so that was 1980, and my professor was at that time the world's best known person in gender issues, and I was actually helping him out at, at what that time was called transsexual clinics. So I've had a lot of years working in this area of sex and sexuality. Very briefly, went back to Sri Lanka, and for six years, I was the only sex therapist in the country. Busy time with 20 million population. <laughs> and 32 years ago, my husband and son and I migrated to Australia. I've been academic with the University of Sydney for 23, 24 years. And the last eight years, I was director of a graduate program in sexual health. So basically, I have spent a lot of my time studying about sex, researching about sex, writing about sex, doing some sex therapy, speaking about sex. My son says that's why he's an only child, because I didn't have a lot of time for practical work. <laughs> so today, in our time together, what I would like to talk to you is a little bit about what does it mean, really? Intimacy, relationships, sex, science, the world, and the word of God. Now, I'm a sexologist. And for those of you who are wondering what a sexologist, it basically all the things that I described to you. We just do a lot of stuff with sex. But being a biologist and a doctor and a Christian is an amazing privilege because I can look at the science and the world and see how wonderful the message that God has to the world. And that, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, is what I want to talk to you about. In 1 Peter chapter 2, we read, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles. Foreigners and exiles. My dear brothers and sisters, your views on sex and intimacy is countercultural to the world. We were hearing from pastor, uh, pastor about your pastor about the wonderful, strong people that we have in your church. And that those people living by God's word were countercultural to the world. And that is what you are called to be. That is what you are called to train your children to be. Because we are on a journey to a better land, to eternity. So, therefore, we are called to keep away from fleshly desires. And we'll talk about how the world draws us and our children to these fleshly desires. Will we be persecuted? As we read on, it says, maintain good conduct among non-Christians so that though they malign you, just a complex word to say persecute you as wrongdoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. My dear brothers and sisters, your actions, your words, point people to the only place where true satisfaction can be found. And that is at the foot of the cross. That is what we are called to do. Now, we as human beings are created by God with natural instincts for sex and desire. Now, when we sexologists talk about sex, we talk about desire, romantic love, 
And what is sexual intimacy? So let me very briefly run those, through these with you. Desire. Ah, desire. Now, maybe not the best thing to be talking about in the middle of a church service, but anyway, it's driven by the hormone testosterone in our brain. Both men and women, it kind of starts bubbling at puberty. And men have about five times as much as women. It kind of explains some things. So <laughs> as we grow up, what we desire, how much we desire it, is influenced partly by what we experience as children, but also strongly by what we put into our brain. Now, in the science, and a very brief science called neuroplasticity, we study that our brains are like plastic. They're malleable. What we put into our brain will influence our attitudes, our values, and thereby our desires. Now, we must think, what are we putting into our brains? And even more importantly, parents, grandparents, and I have such a heart for children. What are our children putting into their brains? Do you know? Do you know what's on their social media? Now, it's not a parenting talk, so I'm not going there. But do you know what social media they are watching? Today's children are being sucked into pornography and gender, transgender ideology by binge watching social media. Do you know, are you doing those conversations with your children and, for those of you who are grandparents, with your grandchildren? You are incredibly important in what's going into their brain. It will affect their future. And that's just desire. Now, desire varies. Some of you are probably like, yeah, let's finish this talk and get home. That kind of desire. And the others are like, Nah, if I trip over it in the car park, I might notice it, that kind. And that's OK. Desire waxes and wanes with time. What about romantic love? Ah, for you couples, it's almost like you're reaching for each other's hand right now with the memories of that time. Romantic love is a different set of chemicals. It's mainly a chemical called dopamine. We call it the reward chemical. You see your beloved, and you know dopamine sprayed all over your brain, and you want that reward of intimacy with your beloved. Dopamine makes you dopey. <laughs> Falling in love is the dopiest thing you will ever do in your life. And we will look more about what the Word of God says, but we're just looking at chemistry. You see, it is powerful. The chemistry that God gives us for desire and for falling in love is strong. It's a strong emotion. But, but, we are not balls of hormones that are rolling around uncontrollably. We have self-control. We have the power of the Spirit that can, can allow, not just allow, but enable us to make right decisions. You know why that's so important? And we need to know it, and we need to be teaching our children. In a world that says self-control is like a swear word, we need to be teaching our children that self-control is a fruit of the spirit. And why? Because sexual intimacy is a binding act. And note I said intimacy, not necessarily intercourse. Any form of sexual intimacy is like forming a super glue bond with the person you are sexually intimate with. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, there is nothing called casual sex. Sex is never casual. And I am not even talking Bible here. I am talking chemistry, neurochemistry, different chemicals, oxytocin, vasopressin. They bind you. And when you break up, it's like tearing that bond. You know, you fall in love and you break up, it hurts. You fall in love and have sex and break up, you grieve because you have bonded. And we can talk a lot about this, but that is the chemistry. Now, we live in a world where we call intimacy is desire-driven. We live in a world of what is called desire-driven individualism. 
A world that says you've got to look into yourself to find out who you are. Somehow, you know, in there is some essence that's going to tell you your authentic self. And then you've got to live out these desires to be happy and content. That's what the world tells you, and that's what the world tells your children. Where do you think all the values of the youth-driven values come from? Where does even transgender ideology come from? Look into yourself. Find out who you are. It doesn't matter about community or family, and definitely not about God. This is the culture your children and you are growing up in. It leads to an aggressive selfishness, one that says your body is just a commodity, like a toy that can be bought at the reject shop, used and thrown away. It has no inner meaning. It's just a toy. It's just a commodity, an object. And it is malleable. You can do whatever you want with it because it has no real meaning. In a world where intimacy is not understood, pleasure and selfish self-gratification is driving our, especially our youth. And my dear parents and young people who are listening in, are you finding this leading to happiness? If we look at the statistics, the rates for anxiety and depression and even self-harm and even suicidality are rising exponentially, especially in our youth, youth. We are not happy because we do not understand that we are created for a truer intimacy, a deeper intimacy. We are created in the image of the creator of the universe. In Genesis chapter 1, we are told that God says, let us make man in our image. What does this mean? We are created in the image of the Trinity. The Trinity is like besties forever. God, Holy Spirit, Jesus couldn't be closer. And that is the image we are created in. We are created for intimacy. And what is the basis, foundation of intimacy? Spiritual intimacy. We are created for spiritual intimacy vertically with the God who created us and then turning that horizontally to be intimate with our brothers and sisters. Every time you pray, now it's so wonderful to hear of prayer meetings in church. And when you meet and you pray for each other, when you meet in your connect or growth groups, when you meet one-to-one -one and read the word of God, you are establishing that foundation. When you read the word of God with your children, and may I encourage you parents, read the word of God and pray with your children every day. They will remember it when they are older establish that spiritual intimacy. And then we can build on that. Now you're going to be having a picnic. That's recreational intimacy. Board games and Mario, whatever, so you know. <laughs> Very good for recreational intimacy. And you might just have some intellectual conversations about the sex talks we've had. So that's intellectual. So we got recreational, intellectual. And then with those good friends, you have that emotional intimacy, that true to be known and to know each other. So you can see how as we get deeper into intimacy, it becomes so important that we share our lives with people. But then we come to physical and sexual intimacy, which is a unique gift. Now, the Bible does say greet each other with a holy kiss, and that's nice. Hugs, little bits of oxytocin peaks that bind you together as a community, as a family of church. But the true physical intimacy is for that one man, one woman marriage. So you can see it's like a pyramid. We can be spiritually intimate, but that 
true one man, one woman intimacy is for marriage. However, singles, you can have such a wonderful, intimate life. You know, the world says that intimacy equals intercourse. And if you're single, and to be a celibate, chaste single, it's like, what's wrong with you? But my dear brothers and sisters, we just look to the word of God. You know, when Jesus said to his disciples in John 15, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. I call you friends. And all that I've heard from the Father, I have made known to you. Jesus, a single celibate man who went to the cross, single and celibate and chaste, says, you are my friends. And that is a friendship. My dear single brothers and sisters, churches should honor you. Because in a world that says, have sex, watch porn, lust over whatever you want to, because that is what individualism says, you say to the world, I don't need that. Christ is sufficient for me. You should be honored. And listen, when Paul spoke to Timothy, he says to Timothy, my true child, in the faith. My dear brothers and sisters, did you realize that every child in this church is your child in the faith? So help parents to nurture their children because they are your children in the faith. And then, and I always love mother-in-law, daughter-in-law stories. Don't you love it? Because all the world is like, oh, she never gets on with her mother-in-law. But we look at Ruth and Naomi. And what do we hear the daughter-in-law say? For where you go, I will go. You lodge, I will lodge. And your people will be my people. And your God will be my God. Spiritual intimacy. Now, for those of you who are mothers-in-law, nurture your daughters-in-law. And if you're a daughter-in-law, ask your mother-in-law to read the word of God with you. What a wonderful resource. And this holds for sons-in-law also. You know, if you ask your father-in-law instead of, well, you know, let's go play golf or rugby or whatever it is. But also let's read the word of God together. So important, spiritual intimacy. And the ultimate intimacy we see for David and Jonathan. When David says of Jonathan in 2 Samuel chapter 1, your love was extraordinary, surpassing the love of women. You see, singles... You can have deep, intimate friendships. But the ultimate intimacy, which the Bible clearly tells us, is that naked and no shame is one flesh marriage. And we have this wonderful eight chapters of Song of Songs. You know, we are falling in love. We've looked at the chemistries and emotion, but that staying in love. I'm married 48 years, and I'm sure looking around here, are some of you who are married a fair number of years. And that staying in love is not about the dopamine tachycardia of seeing your spouse every morning. I mean, 48 years married and retired, if I palpitated every time I saw my husband, I'll be increasing my high blood pressure medication every other day. But you stay in love, you bond with the person. And then you bring back the dopey feelings occasionally. And that happens. You know, no longer like the fireworks over the harbor bridge, more like a sizzle in the backyard barbecue. <laughs> but that sizzle in the backyard barbecue is what keeps you going day to day. Keep the fireworks for the once a year celebration. <laughs> and you know, read Song of Songs together. Every sense of the body, for instance, let him kiss me with the kisses of my mouth, she says. Um, my beloved is to me a sachet of myrrh that lies between my breasts. Use your imagination here, people. <laughs> my beloved is mine and I am his. He grazes among my lilies. <laughs> The lilies, never mind. Your, drip, your lips drip nectar, my bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue. And here is something maybe you wouldn't say to your spouse on the honeymoon, but anyway, your rounded thighs are like jewels, the work of a master hand. Your navel is a rounded bowl that never lacks mixed wine. Well, and we could go on forever. But the reality is, 
that the Bible speaks of the goodness of sexuality in that one man, one woman, what Genesis calls naked and no shame relationship. We need to grasp this intimacy and speak fearlessly to the world. In John chapter 15, Jesus says, my commandment is this, love one another just as I have loved you. No man has greater love than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. And that is what Jesus did. We have an example. In a world that looks to individualism and self-gratification, we have an example that says we look to the other. And in Romans 12, we say, be devoted to one another with mutual love, showing eagerness in honoring one another. Love that cares for the other is always tied in with honoring. Parents, we need to be teaching our children this. It's not about my happiness. It is about the other honoring love. What are your children doing on social media? What are they doing when they're dating? It should be other honoring love, not my gratification. Because the world is full of false intimacy. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, which is a wonderful chapter, which talks about the body being the home of the Holy Spirit, the body belonging to Jesus. And honoring God with the body. It says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually, sins against their own body. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the world entices us and our children to lust after instant quick gratification. We are told that pornography is just something light and titillating wrong. I don't have the time to go into it in detail, but there is nothing called a little porn or good porn. Pornography wires your brain to want that which is evil and completely against God's good plan for sex. So if there's anyone who's struggling here or knows anyone, please get help. It destroys intimacy, it destroys relationships, it destroys marriages. Casual sex, as we said, there is nothing called casual sex. Sex is binding. Living together before marriage, cohabitation, whatever you may call it, all the secular research tells us it is not working. Couples who live together and get married have a much less success in their marriage than those who make a decision, stay chaste, and get married. This is secular research. I'm not making it up. It just happens to be that God said it first before the researchers did the research. See, in marriage, may I speak to the marrieds here, your marriages are based on a beautiful model of Christ and the church. From creation, when God created Adam and Eve, created Adam, and then he brings Eve to him. And Adam was so perfect. You know, everything right. Think of the most good-looking man you can imagine. Wives, I hope it's your husband. And that perfect six-pack. And then he puts him to sleep. God does a bit of a prime rib job, and he brings Eve. And she's perfect. No boob job, no Botox perfect. And Adam looks at Eve, and it's like, oh, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. The most beautiful girl I've ever seen. It helped. He'd never seen another one. But there was <laughs> desire and love, the first blind date, the first arranged marriage in the Garden of Eden. And so through the Bible, we don't have time to go through it, but we see this thread of beauty where marriage is just brought out to you as a pattern right through to Revelation. And in Song of Songs, we read about, you know, place me like a seal on your heart. And we read there that love is like a blazing fire. Blazing fire. Fire is good in the heart, in the right place. Fire in the tinder dry bush destroys people, relationships, marriages. There is nothing casual about sex. 
premarital, extramarital sex pornography is placing that fire in the wrong place. But in the marriage situation, Proverbs 5, let your fountain be blessed, says the writer, the teacher. Rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely, dear, a graceful doe. Let her breast satisfy you with all times with delight. My dear young ones, you're all tight and taut and everything's in the right place. You just wait till you're 75 and things have migrated to Tasmania. <laughs> even then, even then, we are called to delight in each other. See, in, God says in the word of God, delight in the breast of your wife, hey, you know. Who said the Bible doesn't tell us good things about sex? So that's for marriage. What about singleness? Singleness is good. In fact, the Apostle Paul says it's even better than being married. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 7. You see, my dear single brothers and sisters, I've already told you this, but you have such a significant role in the body of Christ. When married people have to worry about, oh, what's for breakfast, what's the children doing, I have to take them. You have the wonderful opportunity to think, what can I do for God today? And how can I get my friends involved in this? Who can I talk to about God today? That is true joy. You know, while we are doing this, it is okay to grieve the loss of marriage. So don't feel bad if as a single person, you feel that you're missing out on something. Don't feel bad about it, but don't dwell on it. Because the reality is that whether you are single or you are married, ultimately true joy rests at the side of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Psalm 16, we read, you make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, if you're married, your marriage shows people the shape of the gospel where love and sacrifice meet. If you are single, you are showing the world that Jesus is sufficient for you. And if your parents nurture your children, to understand this. Now, for any of you who may be feeling in any way challenged by anything I've said today, let me finish on 1 Timothy chapter 1, where we read, this is a trustworthy saying. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. And for this reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience. My dear brothers and sisters, there is no sin that is outside God's forgiveness. There is also no sin that is too small that God doesn't know about it. So if there's anything that has challenged you, don't leave today without talking to someone about it, whether it be porn or extramarital sex or some kind of lust. And just to help you, we do have some resources. So we have some books there in the cafe for you to look at. Most of my writing is around for children. We've got a book called Teen Sex by the Book. And for those of you who have shy teenagers who don't want to talk about sex, that's a great book to give them. They throw it away, and then they pick it up after you've left and read it. After all, it's a sex book, Teen Sex. Growing up by the book is for 10 to 14s, and growing up by the book is extremely important these days because puberty is a critical time, and I don't have, we're not talking about gender, so I'm not going there. And for primary schoolers, we have a book called Birds and Bees, which is six books, a pack of six books to read to your primary schoolers. And Talking Sex by the Book is for you parents and grandparents to read to just learn how to deal with this topic. Because it's very embarrassing sometimes to do the sex talk. So that was written to help you. Now, for all of you who want some good sex in your married life, we have a book called The Best Sex for Life. What else would we call it? Goes from the engagement to the nursing home, where my hubby and I will be soon heading. 
And since I have so much of time on my hands, I, have a, I brought a couple of my creative writing books, one called Empire's Children, set in Sri Lanka, and also Snowy Summer, set in Sri Lanka and in the Snowy Mountains. So if any of you have anything you'd like to talk to me, your pastors have my email, and Lindsay has my email, so please feel free to email me. May I finish with just a quick word of prayer for all you wonderful people. Father God, we just thank you that you are such a good God. You created the universe. You created every one of us. We are, every one of us, precious in your sight. And so, Father, we just come before you as your children, and we claim that promise of an intimacy with you and a true intimacy with each other. We live the lives of everyone here and everyone connected to us. Father, bring a revival on our country. And may we all be moved to speak and live countercultural lives pointing finally to your glory. In the precious name of Jesus, amen.